Hello, everyone. And on behalf of the Victorian team at the Institute of Architects, I'd like to offer you <clears throat> a warm welcome to today's Lean In session, Building Resilience. My name is Gumji King, and I'm a Victorian chapter counsellor and also senior architect with Snowda, based in Melbourne, and a lecturer in architectural design at Melbourne School of Design. And it's my honour to be your host and moderator for today's Lean In session. Before we formally begin, we acknowledge with deep respect the traditional owners of this land where we reside and practice. We acknowledge that it is a privilege to stand on country and we pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Today's Lean In session is being recorded, so if you miss anything today or have to leave early, we'll be publishing this recording on the Institute's YouTube channel in the next couple of days and we'll share that link with you in our upcoming email communications. This lean-in session enables you to ask questions of our panelists. So if you have a question or a comment, please use the Q&A box down below to add your comments or question, and I'll go through this with um, panelists later out in the session. So with this session, we're joined by Dr. Chris Jensen. Um, Chris joined the University of Melbourne from industry, bringing extensive experience as a sustainability consultant on a wide range of projects, including high performance commercial office buildings, energy modeling in Antarctica, shading impacts of super tall buildings and off grid low tech residential dwellings. His expertise includes high performance commercial building facades and design for net zero, often with reference to European trends and systems. His recent research is focused on resilient design solutions in the face of extreme weather events that are increasing in frequency and intensity globally, with numerous recent devastating events in Australia. The examples of this include adaptation design strategies for building preservation to facilitate reuse following a cyclone, flood or fire. So welcome, Chris, um, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Gumji. Very pleased to be here for the Lean In. Uh, welcome to everybody who's joining us. Um, as you can see, Chris Jensen, I'm going to be talking about extreme weather uh, design and adaptation strategies and looking at that field in general. So I hope you find that interesting. This first image, as you can probably tell, I hope you can tell, is a, a very large hailstone event. And I really like starting with this image because it's so out of context with what we think of uh, extreme weather being. But it is all sorts of different things. We will focus on predominantly cyclone, fire and flood, but it can cons consist of many different aspects. Okay, here we go. So as an outline for today, we're going to be uh, sticking to about 40, 45 minutes and we'll cover these topics. So the difference between mitigation and adaptation, uh, looking at what the regulations are in this area, uh, best practice, maybe a little bit about what I'd like you to know from our research. So obviously there's not always a, a, a strong connection between those two. So events like this really help to share that knowledge. And I'll talk a bit about insurance because it's a really interesting aspect to what we are talking about here, mainly because they're driving the agenda in many ways. So it's very interesting to see their take on things uh, obviously financially involved. I hope you can uh, get a little bit of a, a heartstring tug here from the photos. And the purpose of those two images is to illustrate that when it comes to extreme weather and adaptation, we, the human species, we're, we're actually outdoor animals and we're affected in the same way as the rest of the animals, so to speak. So all of these events uh, take away homes, habitats and those sorts of things. So it's just an interesting parallel where I think if we think of mitigation, um, we can kind of deal with mitigation with air conditioning and some of those uh, technologies that we have that animals can't use, but the adaptation is very different. So if we're classifying the two, it's very simple. Mitigation is about uh, trying to avoid a human impact on the climate or the global systems. Um, and we are near experts in that. So when you think of uh, net zero, off grid, all of these things that were mentioned before, uh, we're, we're actually very good at this. I'm not saying we do it all the time, but in terms of our effect on the climate, we're really starting to refine that down. 
now talking extensively about embodied energy and the impact of that as a resource and how we're using materials in the world as well. Adaptation in contrast is uh, very simply the effect of the climate on us. And so it's really flipping things around and saying, hang on, what we've done, climate change, et cetera, et cetera, is now starting to impact our buildings, our way of living and all of the things that go with that. So it's more sudden and uh, direct mitigation or, or long-term climate change like the sea level rise, uh, temperature changes are obviously a slower change, a more benign effect, but the uh, adaptation and extreme weather events are very sudden and quick. Uh, outside of our bubble, which is the building industry and the design industry, a lot of focus on disaster management and life safety. Um, you can see in this next slide the amount of cost or effort we put towards uh, disaster relief versus disaster resilience. And this is one of the things I'm really keen to have an impact on, mostly through all of you or everyone in the, the building industry and how we uh, manage or design our buildings to have less cost, less loss, less uh, damage and uh, cost in recovery. So that's a pretty interesting a statistic to look at the amount of money we spend on resilience versus uh, relief. So this is a pretty standard slide. I'm, I actually don't have a lot of slides on climate change. I think everyone's across this, but it's a nice little slide from the Climate Commission showing the widespread impact. And obviously we could have a global slide here. Um, and we all know of fires in Portugal or California, uh, floods in Bangladesh. It, it's everywhere, obviously. So we will focus on Australia because it's where I think most of us are working. Uh, this is another great image here just to illustrate the changing temperature as a changing climate. So you can see the, uh, the much earlier years of the, the typical summer temperature. This is in Europe. Um, I'll show you in the next slide where you can get these. Um, I think they're called a bar, bar graph or sliding graph. I'll come to that in a minute. But all of the warm uh, examples are quite recent. So these things we know. Now I put this in here because I thought you'd actually like to, to use it. You might use it in presentations. You can see, uh, show your stripes. So you can put in any uh, location and look at the data um, and it's very nice visual representation. So you can see the global uh, Australia impacts and Victoria as well. And there's a obviously undeniable trend that we're all very well across. Um, now, as I mentioned right up front, I will be referring pro primarily to flood, fire and uh, cyclone. Um, the reason for that is they have the most detrimental effect on buildings. I think you can imagine that. It's notwithstanding the fact that extreme weather does include uh, a broader uh, range of impacts and they vary. So I, um, the hailstone slide, I actually have a really good image of a solar PV panel sort of smashed to pieces by hail. So maybe less uh, dramatic and uh, costly to replace things like that. But it is important to consider that there are a range of different impacts like that. Now, when we get past the, the sort of climate change at large topic and we start talking about extreme weather, very familiar uh, concepts as well. These little plot lines, the colours are represented by those areas in the map at the top left. And although it's not super dramatic, this, this graph, you can see the increase in the frequency of the extreme weather and also the severity. So you can see the very high peaks in some cases, mostly in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, and these are recorded um, extreme weather events and their occurrence and their severity. So it's it's obviously getting worse. We, I think we know that from an um, extreme weather perspective, what's going to happen in the future, uh, we generally have the best records for rainfall and temperature. Um, and so they're focused on, which, which is quite relevant really for what we're looking at. But you can see a couple of examples there of what might happen. So uh, the top graph is showing a general increase in temperature, which will of course lead to uh, hot weather and record hot weather. And then you can see if you're a statistician, you would know that that's an increase in the st standard deviation. 
and we have a hotter and colder or, or more extreme, basically, climate. And then the bottom is perhaps a combination of two. And maybe the most concerning with regards to temperature and heat, where we have a lot more um, hot weather and, and very hot weather. Rainfall is a little bit uh, more difficult to understand. You can see the images there and the top image of the map of Australia shows that, in fact, across the last 70 years, the East Coast has become drier. And that's, um, that's quite appropriate if you think back 10 or 15 years, the drought um, and those times. But if you're thinking of the floods, that's obviously much more recent, isn't necessarily represented there. So looking at that trend, it might be a little bit different to what we're used to across the last uh, few years. And you can see there that the variation in the Murray-Darling Basin um, probably leans more towards a drier outcome overall. And I'm sure you're, you're aware of La Nina and El Nino. So um, this is very relevant to me. I really like uh, bringing in what the industry is doing. And I don't just mean the building industry, but how everyone in Australia is dealing with this. And you can see those images. So uh, Commonwealth Bank has a, a big status for uh, extreme weather and the risk of their mortgages. So they have a big piece about how many mortgages are at risk because of this. Um, the, the very iconic photo of the Malakuta area um, on fire and then the Climate Council, uninsurable nation, Australia's most climate vulnerable places. So there is a statistic that one in every 25 properties will be high risk and uninsurable. So what does that mean for uh, the design industry? Does that mean the obvious thing, which is we don't build in certain locations, or does it mean we adapt and create buildings that will withstand some of these things? So just looking at some of the other notes there, the reference to Commonwealth Bank, um, extreme fire days, the destructive flood, so third costliest extreme weather, 4.8 billion, I, I would love it if you guys were on camera. I would ask you what the other two were, but I can't. It's um, the hail, uh, hail storm and just the storm in general in Sydney. And Cyclone Tracy are the other two that are more uh, costly. So I mentioned this earlier, but the take home message from looking at the climate data and, and where we are at the moment is that we are very good at dealing with mitigation. Uh, passive house, all of these strategies to make very um, low impact buildings. We've got that, so to speak. I think we would all agree with that. Doesn't mean our clients will go for it, but still. Um, and what we need to do now is think about the impact that the environment is having on buildings and how we work as designers with that. So um, let's have a look at the, the regulations. This is the, probably the least exciting part of the session, but it's good to go through anyway. Number one, and I think everyone knows this, NCC, uh, which used to be the BCA, it's in existence for life preservation. So it is to make sure buildings are safe for humans, including if there's a, a fire in the building to be able to evacuate, structural provisions so it stands up, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the really interesting things about design for adaptation is to uh, add to life preservation safety and talk about building preservation so um, what's the point of a building that withstands a flood if we have to knock it down post flood event because of the mold and the timber rot and uh, the other damage that's occurred so uh, I think that's a really interesting thing to to look at if we just go through we'll go through cyclone uh, flood and fire in how it's captured in the NCC. Now, you're probably familiar with parts or all of this, um, and it, it's still obviously important to go through. Sorry, I thought there's a missing piece there. We're familiar with uh, volume two and the uh, part three, so the deemed satisfied provisions, and you'll be familiar likely with those categories on the side there. Um, the ABCB in 2014 had this document which is freely available the resilience of buildings to extreme weather events had some very interesting outcomes and recommendations um, if I was being a little bit critical I'd say not really any of them have made it into 2019 or 2022 
Um, and I think that will start to change now. But it's one of those uh, risk versus consequence 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 type of problems. Uh, very high uh, damage at the end, but potentially low risk, especially to a lot of buildings. So they've got a decision to make about do we apply uh, increased costs and requirements to all buildings or uh, how do we assign it to locations? So uh, structural provisions are primarily used in the structural provision section of our code to deal with cyclones. And as you can see, it's very much about the strength of the building and that's not at all surprising. So uh, regarding roofs, uh, wind actions and wind loading, I do really like the two images on the right. So the image at the top shows the, the high wind or cyclone regions. And as we know, that's uh, predominantly the north part of Australia. And the bottom one is this sort of crazy pattern of where cyclones actually occur. And I like this because it's the weather and its events and how, how it's uh, occurring in Australia. And then our, our neat little map of how we're going to deal with it. Now it's obviously appropriate and relevant, but the two images together are quite interesting, I think. So um, cyclone, that's Cyclone Tracy. So pretty big impact. And I imagine the entire place got, all, all of those buildings or almost all of them were fully demolished, cleared, and started again. Something that's really important to remember, and I've spoken to uh, people who've been through the bushfires in Victoria more than anything else, and in many cases, they actually don't want to return there because of what's happened. Um, so there's this other barrier about the communities and the damage it does to communities. I mean, in this case, there's total destruction, but in, in other cases, people do remain um, and other people's houses have gone and um, need to make a decision about what they're going to do. Um, if we move on to flooding, you'll see one of the SBO maps there. Um, this is an interesting one. And you'll, you'll see the theme here with the, the three types of extreme weather I'm referring to. There is a set uh, requirement to achieve some sort of deemed to satisfy performance approach to uh, dealing with extreme weather events. And then there's the uh, area that it applies to. So I'm sure you're familiar with dealing with the SBOs um, and looking at the ARI 100-year flood levels and basically being told what to do. And you might be very familiar with the fact that in uh, flood zones, you have to elevate the floor area and you have a freeboard amount as well. So it's a pretty basic static kind of solution to dealing with flood. And the, the second thing that's really obvious is that this data that we're creating SBOs or cyclone regions or bushfire uh, areas from is historical data. And we have no choice but to use that. But we do need to think about the fact that if increases to extreme weather uh, frequency and severity continue, then we need to somehow plan ahead a bit better. So, so look forward um, to what we might have to be dealing with. Um, and you can see there the flood hazard requirements are tucked into additional construction requirements. And you'll see that, in fact, the bushfire one is just two down. So part 3.10.5 is bushfire areas. I'll, I'll stick with my flood theme for now. So um, the, the damage, not just to buildings, but to contents. Um, embodied energy is, is massive at the moment, super important in the uh, designed decisions for buildings. Um, if we design a building for 50 years, but it gets flooded every five years, we need to start thinking about materials that maybe do, do they need to be durable in the last 50 years or do they need to be low impact And because we, we're going to replace them every five years? Not to mention, as is shown in this uh, image, the uh, this spewing out of materials and products that come post-flood. So uh, that's an important thing to consider as well. Even if it's the furniture, definitely things like floor coverings and, and that sort of thing. Okay, I imagine everyone's pretty familiar with uh, 3959 for the bow ratings. And this is a this is actually to me, this is a success story 
in the regulations with regards to uh, extreme weather and, and disaster type of events. The reason I say that is because it has a degree of uh, flexibility, almost a bit of a performance solution approach. So uh, depending on what bell rating you require, so from 0, 12.5 up to flame zone, you have guidance about what materials are appropriate and whether you have uh, shutters and things like that on the building. So I think that's quite a, a, a usable um, regulation because it has that uh, flexible approach. And obviously, if you're in a, a, um, a heavy bushfire area and in Victoria, I think of Wye River or certainly up in the mountains to the east around uh, King Lake and Healesville and those areas, you have to have a very uh, significant response. And um, that is provided here with some choices. Now, I do remind you, and it's true of uh, energy performance, which is that sort of mitigation angle, that um, these are minimums. So it's not like achieving a bow rating of 40 is some impressive outcome. It's a minimum requirement to build. Yes, it increases cost, et cetera, et cetera, but it is the minimum requirement for that house in that location, and that's something that we need to uh, take on board. And part of my message for this session is that it's with you guys as designers to go above and beyond, and there's some really innovative solutions that are built. You will have seen them in various publications um, that really tackle, I think particularly bushfire in Victoria is a really good example I hope we see some uh, flood examples um, coming out of the East Coast as well and strategies and solutions. So um, another image to really evoke the, the sort of the drama and the severity of what we're talking about. Uh, fairly horrific kind of thing to have to live through, I think. And it makes you conscious of why people might choose not to return to these areas. And you could argue from a, a macro um, sort of design perspective, should we be in those areas? Of course, we should question that too. Flood and fire, definitely. Now, I mentioned overheating. It's, it's not something that causes total devastation to a building, of course, but I think it's a good example where the code has a, a degree of flexibility. So you're all familiar with six and now seven stars uh, energy performance. And one of the other requirements is the heating and cooling load. So what this is, is a, a, it's not quite a performance solution, but it allows flexibility in design to reduce what I'm focused on here is the cooling load limit. So instead of telling us we need certain structural elements for cyclone or we need certain floor heights for flood, what the strategy for overheating is, is to say, we don't really care what you do as long as the software says that you are not required to use more cooling than this. Now, this is, it's a better solution, but it's still not uh, perfect because there are many challenges with west-facing apartments, for example, that have no opportunity except to uh, cop that heat. Um, I've done a lot of research with overheating and looking at retrofit strategies, so external shading to curtain walls or um, reflective roof materials and things like that. And it, there is some really good strategies, particularly in retrofit, but ultimately uh, getting it right at the start is the right thing to do. Okay, so um, little take-home message. You can see I'm a lecturer at university, no doubt. Uh, focus on life safety historically with areas defined from historical data. So that's where we are perhaps falling behind. And if you said that six or seven stars is our minimum performance requirement and you look at the high performance strategies whether it's um, net zero or passive house or something like that that's a um, a carrot approach or something that we should be targeting and designing for as opposed to uh, relying on those fairly simplistic uh, measures good we're going okay time wise okay so as i hope you saw just before we're looking now at the the best practice uh, strategies towards adaptation and resilience. Green Star Homes is an interesting tool. It's not that old. Um, it is only available to volume home builders. Now, it doesn't mean you can't use the principles, but certainly in terms of being uh, rated uh, officially, it's only for that use. Uh, 
and as consistent with a lot of the the approach to green star now they've sort of uh switched into these categories like is shown here positive so particularly around energy healthy so IEQ and resilient which which is a new one here and you can see a quick definition of positive and healthy to uh, explain where they're going with that but I think it's particularly impressive and obviously relevant to us to have included resilient now um, I'll be first to say it's not particularly difficult to achieve this and in fact there's many non-mandatory requirements in this but what it is is it's a step towards uh, including this in the design conversation um, and general knowledge I guess as to what is required so uh, although I can understand the use of the inclusion of say water use and water consumption in resilient it's probably not quite as uh, relevant for the type of house this tool applies to which is a, a volume built house um, with regards to bushfire flooding and and heat but there are some really really relevant components to this so uh, that list shows those that are mandatory and you'll see that there's the three and then there's the other categories which are um, required project teams are required to explain why it's not included so you can imagine for example sea level rise if you're you know doing some houses in hilly area you would easily get out of that of course so that's the reference there but um, heat we we're very familiar with that and storms and the community connection one they've got some really interesting uh, credits or, or requirements in here I won't touch on all of them, but there's that design element that's thermal comfort in extreme heat. So sort of blurring the line between our, our traditional energy and um, IEQ mitigation type of approaches with a resilience and adaptation strategy, but they're still very relevant. I love the the sort of the thinking and, and the less obvious ones like the outdoor services, so HVAC and hot water should be in the shade. Um, that's I mean, it's a no-brainer, right? And to have that as a, a credit requirement or a credit available um, is a really good idea because it will increase longevity, hopefully reduce uh, sort of the total energy use, especially for a air conditioner condenser running. Uh, it doesn't need to be running in the heat, so I really like that. Uh, Extreme Storms is is mostly focused on applying the cyclone requirements to or houses. So I think that's really interesting too, because they haven't said, here's our new unique approach. They've just said, what is required in high wind cyclone areas? We want you to do in all houses. So I look quite like that approach. And the connection and the resilience, so a mixture there of uh, communication requirements and things like electric vehicle charging and some sort of built in uh, resilience, I guess, which is quite an interesting approach. As I said, it's uh, got its strengths and weaknesses, but I love that it's a part of the, the whole tool now. Now, I guess this is where it becomes a bit more interesting, and I hope you guys might benefit from this and use it in your work. Uh, there are quite a lot of other guidance documents available in this field, so obviously focusing typically on one of the types of extreme weather, um, and you can see these here are related to flood, but they, they are available and particularly the, uh, the Queensland Reconstruction Authority documents are very practical. I'll, I'll show you some of those. Um, so the next three slides are all the Queensland Reconstruction Authority uh, produced documents that they were funded federally for. Uh, so the whole reconstruction project. And uh, the, this one here is the cyclone. It's probably the least visually um, detailed, but it's got a lot of advice in there to deal with design. Um, wind pressures, I think, um, are mostly dealt with for most normal buildings as part of the normal design and construction process. But if you start talking about buildings over 100, uh, sorry, winds over 100 kilometres an hour, it's not just about strapping down your your uh, trusses it's about a whole lot of things 
your roof sheets and the materials that you're using and the design approach of it too. So, so that's quite an interesting one, probably the least uh, useful immediately as for architects, but the, uh, the bushfire one, so the um, Queensland Homes document, this has page after page of, of really interesting details that you can uh, apply to most projects really. So um, looking at uh, the layers and the materials and the insulation and where uh, gaps and things like that are sealed up, uh, non-combustible linings and uh, information about uh, the, the gutters particularly. So uh, a lot of usable information in this, this guide as well. And I'd say my favourite of them all is the flood resilient one. Um, this again has page after page of different types of houses and different construction. So uh, this is a, obviously a double story, uh, what, there you go, masonry rendered concrete block example. And there's a whole range of strategies outlined to, um, to deal with flooding. And this is where I really emphasize this requirement for building retention. So um, I think if you think of new design, mitigation strategies, maybe retrofit, and then in, in this area of extreme weather, uh, building retention, you need to start thinking about some pretty different things. So plasterboard in a flood, for example, is, is no use. It needs to be removed and um, replaced. So what are the options? Obviously, things like masonry surfaces. Um, you can see a lack of floor covering here. Um, the permeable hardwood screening. There is really a lot of useful information out of this uh, guide. So I'll leave you to have a look at that if you're interested. But from a um, best practice perspective, uh, there's some really good resource available, but at the moment it's limited in its application. Now those Queensland guides in for the most part can be used anywhere, but there is specific relevance obviously to that region. And most of the documents are, are similar i mean the other documents other than the queensland reconstruction authority that's um the maribyrnong recently in the background there okay so if we have some design lessons and um again with my my lecture approach you've got to repeat things a lot because people don't always get it the first time uh so summary slides always good so mitigation, really well understood, and there's no reason adaptation strategies can't be the same. When you are designing a new house, and I'm going to assume it's probably in a more rural or coastal area, you need to think about these events and the impact on this building. Uh, it's a really high quality outcome to have a you know, net zero off-grid disaster proof house, all right? I think that makes sense. So we need to start thinking about how to do that. And there is some information uh, available and we need to start thinking about the retention of buildings in this regard. So I think a success story in the regulations is Cyclone and the, the new requirements have really massively minimised the amount of damage to houses. There's a really good graph actually uh, that shows the damage to houses from Cyclones over the years and it, it obviously just reduces as the more recent that you get. Um, and there are some interesting tools there, but just bear in mind they're minimums and it's with you guys to determine what is going to be the required level of performance. Um, so even looking at that image down the bottom there, that uh, the Bushfire Council Australia has produced that top image. I can't remember what it's called, Kenzo or something like that. Um, and they've developed a assessment tool for... Uh, the design as well in, in regards to bushfire, although I, I don't think it's yet to be widely used. There's a floating house, so perhaps that's the future for some, some areas that are very low-lying, um, but preferably we don't build in those certain areas. Um, lots of little things that you can talk about, and I showed you in some of those guides, so I won't go over that. Um, we talk about mould so much at the moment, and that's a huge problem in in buildings and air tightness and things like that. Um, you should see the mold after a flood in a house or the, the rot to timber. It's really quite amazing. Simple things like is the electrical uh, installation in the ceiling or does it go around the, the floors and what makes things more reusable? All right, I'll be quick with this because we haven't got a lot of time left. 
Now, I mentioned that insurers are really relevant here because they're making the financial decisions for us about what will get insurance and what premiums will be. This first uh, slide here, this is only a few days ago where you can see the assistant treasurer said that insurers need to start adjusting uh, premiums to houses that make an effort to design for uh, these extreme events. So that's a sort of a no-brainer at that um, economic um, high level about how we need to modify this. Um, and that would be something that you would also consider. So uh, they have this huge influence over it. And what's really relevant to me in some of my research is that the, the influence and the knowledge they have is completely asymmetric to what a homeowner has. So uh, if you're lucky when you're purchasing a property, you know enough to know what an SBO is or um, a BMO or something like that. And I think you would all know that you've had clients who haven't really looked at that and it's increased their cost in construction. What also increases their premium and their, their risk of having a problem. So you can see the climate valuation slide shows um, a, a way that things are calculated for different areas, obviously related to the, the risk. So we all know insurance is based on risk and making money. So we have to work with that. Um, and you can see there the, the change in premiums over time is going up. Um, I hear probably weekly, if not fortnightly, of someone saying, oh my goodness, my premiums increased times five for no reason. And when we investigate, what it turns out is that the insurance company has changed its risk of a particular stormwater drain overflowing or something like that. So you may not be in a, a low-lying sort of inundation type of situation, um, but there is still decisions being made about your premiums and your policy based on some of those other things. So um, this is a really big factor. And just add to this one that um, you might not get insurance. So uh, it, it is... I think important to consider at that early design stage with what the building will be. So uh, there's another graph and set of uh, statistics for you. Is climate change pushing up home insurance premiums in Australia? Yes, it is. Um, where they're on the rise, so you have access to this afterwards so you can read and, and look at that in more detail if you're interested. Uh, the Insurance Council of Australia is really uh, relevant for this, this data. Uh, sorry, that's um, not got any pictures. That's all right. So Swiss Re is a reinsurer very quickly. You may not know this, that if you take out insurance policy with Suncorp or someone, your flood damage, fire, and all of that is reinsured with uh, someone or reinsurer called some, something like Swiss Re. There's about well, there's a bunch of them. There's three that are the largest that do this. And it's of interest to us that they, if they make the decision that your stormwater drain is going to overflow, your insurance provider won't insure you because they can't get insurance for the risk that is being presented. So that's quite an interesting one. Now, as I said, insurers are having a big effect on the uh, approach to buildings and and the way things are done because they hold the um, hold the cards I suppose when it comes to covering you so for whatever reason flood cyclone uh, fire um, and many of them have tools that are um, they're useful they're a bit sort of generic in a way Suncorp's uh, one house tool is really interesting it's got some good tips on what makes a good house. And they also have what's called Resilience Road, which is a, a road, I actually don't know where it is, it's in Queensland somewhere, where they've retrofitted houses for different strategies. So you can look up Suncorp Resilience Road and uh, see some of the things that were done for different reasons, so fire versus flood and that sort of stuff. Here's an example of the type of um, ideas that they have. So sacrificial gutters, so in a bushfire rather than the gutters and the leaves catching fire and going into the roof. Um, the gutters melt and fall away because bushfire is very different to a house fire. It's very high heat intensity, but for a short period, 
So if you can avoid uh, the building catching fire and the windows going and things like that, there's a really good chance of uh, building retention and obviously contributes to life safety. Oh, there's my picture. Okay. And they have their own guidance about storm damage, most of which is covered. So most policies will cover these things. Flood is the really unique one where there's all sorts of specifics about fluvial versus pluvial. So fluvial is a river overflow. Fluvial is where a stormwater drain or something back floods an uh, area of land. Um, and I think this is close to my last slide. The flood, uh, sorry, the insurers use something called the National Flood Information Database, which is a, um, a third party developed flooding tool. Now, this is the example, and one of the relevances of including insurance in this session is why isn't this the same as what the council uses for the SBOs, or at least available for comparison? That to me makes sense. Provide the homeowner or the designer with the information based on advanced modeling as opposed to uh, rainfall events of the last 100 years. So there's some interesting things to uh, think about like that. And with that, I'll, I'll end. I hope you've uh, found that interesting, but it's um, a lot to take in. I'm very conscious that architects get more and more uh, responsibility and, and, and things loaded on them with BAL and changing codes and client requirements. And maybe this is just another one to think about, but um, please, I hope you'll see the relevance of this and you might consider designing uh, with these things in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was really informative and insightful presentation. As you said, I think it's a really great starting point, uh, starting point for some of us, you know, potentially being inundated with information um, at this day and stage as well. We have a couple of questions. So, I'd like to go through them and while we have some time. The first question is from Gregory. So in from his experience on a previous PHI passive house certified project in Canada, um, so he was involved in um, sort of originally designed to climate data from between 2010 and 2015. But as it turns out by 2018, um, it was out of date with the latest data. So it was too low in his estimates um, and so forth. So he was wondering if there was a projected climate data in Australia that we can use as practitioners that is in format that can be sort of plugged into the PHPP model. So, you know, he's um, essentially asking for sort of not past dated information. Uh, yeah, the the answer I'm 95% confident in is that the, the NATAS climate files have the files for use for accreditation, and then they also have a version of it that is projected into the future. And I'd have to look up how to access that. Um, the other thing that is possible is to look at the uh, IPCC projections. Um, I had a, a colleague and I did a bit of research on looking at how uh, cities, a particular design in cities around Australia would be affected by a two degree rise. And uh, it may not be a surprise to hear that you have a less heating and, and more cooling. And it's really interesting to think about. Uh, it is it is that simple. We had a simplistic um, change to the, the weather file. So when you think of humidity and the Indian Ocean Dipole and all the effects that go into it, it might not be that simple. But looking at it simply uh, from a house performance, it is switching from heating to cooling. And you may have found that also in your passive house um, outcome. Great, thank you. Um, next question is also on the passive house. So this is one from Alistair. Would you say that you think that passive house standard homes have sustainable embodied carbon emissions across their life cycle? Yeah, um, that's a good question, and um, I uh, I'm very into thermal performance and design myself. And passive house is obviously this sort of um, uh, very specific approach to it. So I think what I would say is that it's generally accepted that there's more material in a passive house. Now, when you get into calculating offsets in embodied energy and life cycle carbon, it can be difficult to prove one way or the other. Um, we did some research going back uh, 
at least 10 years ago now that said for a set of criteria in particular climate, about 7.5 to 8 stars, so in the, obviously in that HERS system, was the optimal when considering the increased embodied energy of additional materials. So a really good example to me, I was actually watching Grand Designs New Zealand last night, and there was it included a, a passive house that uh, was interesting. And they're talking about triple glazing. Um, if you are the type of person who requires 20 to 21 degree internal temperature and you would have your heat on, heating on a lot if you didn't achieve that, then the triple glazing might be more worthwhile. If you're more flexible in terms of uh, indoor temperature, maybe you leave the doors and windows open sometimes, it may not be worthwhile. So um, I think the answer is that it's a very important point about the embodied energy built into a house that's very high performance um, and it's going to be different for different applications. I'd also contrast solar PV as well. Lots of discussion about the embodied energy of solar PV. Um, so, you know, it's a wicked problem with multiple answers. Really. Yeah. Um, next one's actually from myself. I just wanted to ask, um, you know, as a practitioner, we're increasingly responding to more urbanised and dense environment that we're designing for. Mm. Do you have recommendations or approaches that you think um, are more appropriate for urban uh, environment or sort of more um, high density buildings? Yeah, it's pretty easy to talk about uh, overheating in heat waves. So um, I mentioned earlier, I've done a lot of research in that. And, and the way to think of it is there's a heat wave causes overheating and that causes heat stress for occupants. Um, so we've got a lot of opportunity with obviously things like uh, greenery, roof colours, um, the amount of garden and space, which we often don't have control over. Um, and then the decisions about thermal mass and when we condition the indoor space. So there's technically nothing wrong with addressing a heat wave with air conditioning if it's solar powered, right? So if you if you put together the right pieces, it can work very effectively. And I I would say that that um, that urban area um, sort of issue or adaptation with a focus on the overheating is relatively well understood, and we we tend not to do it. So we tend to have black grooves and and the rest of the things. I mean, it's quite common people have buildings with no shading on windows and those sorts of things. So it's just about the priority. And, and I'm not here to tell everyone to be the greenest greenie, but um, I think most people already know how to deal with those things. And it's you sort of educating clients, battling costs to get those realities. Yeah, thank you. Um, next question from Jim. Uh, what impact would a renewable-based energy system have on the value of passive thermal performance? Um, yeah, okay, that's interesting. So I presume we're talking about solar PV. Um, I, it is amazing to me to think that solar PV isn't a minimum requirement in the code now in terms of uh, bang for buck. So if you think of a six kilowatt system being maybe seven or eight thousand dollars depending on your rebate um, and that will not only reduce the bills but contribute significantly to your equipment uh, energy offset so um, I don't want to suggest that you should have low thermal performance and a lot of solar but it is an interesting theoretical kind of counterpoint to having a very high thermal performance maybe more expensive uh, building envelope and not having solar. So um, I would say that in answer to your question, solar PV won't affect your thermal performance, but it means you can use your services with less impact and less guilt, perhaps. Yeah. Um, just on follow-up for the solar PV, uh, there was a question asking if there was a good solution to protect solar PV from hail or storm events. No. No, there's not. <laughs> yeah, you, I think it's triggered by that image that you posted. Yeah, you'll see some uh, manufacturers talk about double layer glass and, and I'm sure some are stronger than others, but at the end of the day, you're talking about a baseball coming from 
you know, however many kilometres in the air and smashing onto a piece of glass, it's never going to be good. Mm. If you could break a roof tile and, and, you know, all of that, smash a car windscreen, it's um, going to be difficult. The force of nature. Um, yeah. Just on follow-up, I think Jim's question on the renewable base energy system, he was asking if that was based on, oh, sorry, if it's a national grid. Uh, so renewable based energy system as a national grid, if that has a impact on the value of passive thermal performance. It, um, I don't know if I'm understanding Jim's question correctly. So I think I might need that rewarded <laughs> if possible. Yeah. Um, obviously, energy supply is the other big equation that as designers, we don't really um put much thought into because it you know it comes down the wire from wherever but rooftop solar obviously feeds back into the grid um, and remote large solar is very effective but it has the transmission losses so so mm. okay um there are no further questions really we went through quite a kind of comprehensive list of both passive house um, and a right range of typologies at the moment. Um, I'll leave maybe a couple of minutes um, while I talk if there is any other follow up questions on the questions that were answered previously. Um, I would also just like to remind everyone that this session is recorded. I mentioned at the very beginning um, that it will be posted on the Institute's YouTube channel as well. So that's also um, answered in Q&A if you're still looking for um, the YouTube channel. So that would be all. Oh, great. I, okay. I might comment if it's okay that I'm more than happy for people to email me, whether it's um, collaborations or questions. It's uh, C Jensen at Unimog, edu au. Great. Okay. I don't think there are any other follow up questions. Um, in that case, I think we're probably good to conclude this session. Thanks again, Chris, for a really great presentations and um, thanks everyone for attending and including all the really interesting questions as well. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you and have a nice day, everyone.